Hello everyone and welcome back to Russell's Movie Reviews, the show where I review stuff that's mostly pretty good, maybe one of the best movies of all time, or a film that absolutely sucks and should remain in the depths of hell. Now, before we get on to the review itself, I just want to mention a few things before we uh, start the review. First off, thank you everyone for already reaching the goal that I put out a few times already of 130 subscribers. We already hit that yesterday and I'm so thankful to every single one of you. So now I want to up the ante and say let's try and get to 150 by the end of the year i originally was gonna say 150 before but now i was like maybe that's a little bit too much so i'll just set it to 130 since i was pretty close to it anyway and you guys killed it within the first week of me mentioning it so thank you so much and um you know like i said now the goal is to get to 150 subscribers by the by December 31st of this year if we can do that that would be the best way to end off the year for me so yeah I just want to mention that first second off you guys couldn't tell by the shirt uh, yesterday was uh, Star Trek day so I just want to say happy uh, late Star Trek day for anyone who's a fan and because I know I was a little late on that one but uh, I it was on a Thursday and usually I don't really post videos on uh, Thursdays, so I was just like, I'll, I'll mention it in tomorrow's review, so that's what I did. So, yeah. But anyway, with all that out of the way, let's get started with the review. So, if you guys remember about almost a year ago now, which is crazy to think about, I reviewed a little movie called Lionheart, which starred Jean-Claude Van Damme, and I think was actually my first Jean-Claude Van Damme film that I ever discussed. Now... I was like looking for my collection and looking for his catalog of films. I'm like, wow, I really don't have that much of his stuff. And then recently, uh, Oliver Harper, who I talked about last time with the Dante's Peak review, uh, he did a review on uh, the next film that came after it. And I was like, oh, that got an MVD release as well. Let's you know see how much it is. And luckily, around that time. Uh, there was a the, the Black Friday sale that was going on, so I got that in another movie for about twelve to fifteen bucks each, so around thirty in total. And I was like, "Oh great, okay, I got another Van Damme movie, which means I could talk about it." And I held it back for a little bit because I was like, "I already had the rest, you know, off, you know, kind of like a whole schedule planned out." But then once I kind of hit that drywall where I was like, "Okay, what do I do?" I didn't really think about it and then when i was after the batman and robin review when i was scheduling the rest of the episodes i thought i remembered that i had this movie and so i thought why not have a two-part kind of like disaster film thing which was the end the redux review for independence day and the dante's peak review which was a monday let's do a two-part martial arts thing right after it so i thought to start off this two-parter, why not talk about the other Van Damme film that I have, which you guys can tell by the title of the thumbnail, is Double Impact, which was released on August 9th of 1991. Now, like I said, my history with this film basically started with that Oliver Harper review, but I did hear about it here and there before, but I obviously couldn't really watch it until I got this Blu-ray, which, ironically enough, a week after I, it came in the mail... I watched it for the first time and I thought it was great. And obviously, I had to rewatch it again for this review, and I'll discuss my opinions on this on the film as we go on. So this was made with a budget of about sixteen million. Domestically, it made over thirty million, and worldwide, it has not been confirmed yet, but it has deemed uh, it was deemed to be a success worldwide. And this was directed by Sheldon Lenish, who obviously directed Lionheart before this film. So I knew. When his name came up as director for this film, I knew I was in good hands because I liked, I, well, I loved the Lionheart so much that I was like, okay, I'm in good hands with this film. So let's move on to that plot, shall we? In 1966, the Hong Kong Victoria Harbor Tunnel, which was built by Paul Wagner's company and financed by Nigel Griffith, uh, played by uh, Alan Scarfy, opens to the public. Paul is joined by his wife and his two children, Chad and Alex. After the celebration, Paul and his wife are killed by a triad hit squad. Frank Avery, who is played by Jeffrey Lewis, uh, 
who is Paul's bodyguard, arrives soon after and is too late to save Paul and his wife. But he does save Chad while, uh, while the family's maid escapes with Alex. The maid drops Alex off at a Hong Kong orphanage and Frank raises Chad in France. 25 years later, Frank reunites the twins and explains that they need to join forces in order to take down Nigel Griffith and his business partner, Zhang. So, yeah, it's your, I, it's kind of like, you know, I, okay, um, it's basically, it's, it's a really kind of unique plot for the time where, and even nowadays when you look back on it, where it's basically, yeah, twins separated, uh, about when they were about six months old and then reuniting, uh, 25 years later to go and claim what is rightfully theirs from some e egotistical pricks so i say that's some really good you know material for a really good movie and it does show off um you know because again like with this film being directed by the same guy who did lionheart it shows that it's the same guy because the the art like the the visual style and the directing is very kind of similar to Lionheart, which I'll get to as I, you know, talk about more about this movie. So obviously we have, you know, the ceremony where basically it's like, yay, the, you know, the tunnel is open, whatever. And then we, you know, we, like, we have some like banter between uh, Paul and his wife between Paul, his wife, and then, uh, you know, uh, Frank, which it's like, okay, it, that establishes that they, they've known each other for a very long time and they're very good friends with each other. So, you know, establishing characters, I like it. But unfortunately, the guy that they got to play, Paul Wagner, is so wooden in the, like, in the few scenes that he's in that it's just like, like, wh like why? Like, like, in the, uh, Jeffrey Lewis is doing great in the role as Frank, but, like, the guy who they got to play Paul is just so fucking wooden, I'm just like, fucking really, dude? Uh, but the wife is not that bad. So, they, Paul says, like, okay, you got the night off, and as he, as Frank drives off, you see this, like, uh, like, kind of like this, uh, this, like, car that, like, this, uh, that starts to follow them, and he's like, yeah, and the, the, there is one great line that he does deliver, though, where it's like, he radios Frank, and he's like, uh, hey, Frank, remember that I told you that you had the night off, and he's like, yep, I sure do, and he's like, yeah, I take that one back, and, and then he's like, Frank, he's like, oh, oh wait, oh, shit, and it drifts the car around and just floors it towards him, he's like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, uh, they arrive, Paul and his wife, along with the two kids and the maid, they arrive at the house, and it's surrounded by a whole bunch of Chinese gangsters that start fucking up their car. And uh, Fra Fra you know, Frank radios them. He's like, D Paul, whatever you do, don't get out of the fucking car. And Paul, being an idiot, goes into the glove box, grabs a pistol, and starts shooting him. Granted, he does get a couple guys, but he does get lit up too, and he does subsequently die. And then, obviously, the wife's like, oh, my God, my husband. And she gets shot in the shoulder. And then we get, uh, I think it's, um, I think it's uh, Moon. Walks up to her and just points this fucking shotgun in her face. Just, <laughs> like, fuck, man, that's cold. Well, yeah, because uh, she's like, my babies. What are you going to do to my babies? And she's like, um, and then he's like, uh, you should have thought about that one. And then, I'm like, fucking Christ. And then, obviously, Frank arrives and starts basically murdering all of them, except for Moon, who he, like, basically shoots in the face, but it's, like, it skims him, and he gives him, like, this, like, really cool-looking, like, scar. And, like, fr uh, Frank's like, get out of here to the maid, and, like, like take the kids, get out, and... The maid only brings uh, Alex, or like she only takes Alex, and it's like, and the look on his face when he realizes the the that uh, Alex is still, when the chat's still in there, and he looks back, it's like that fucking bitch. So, 
he starts shooting, and then as he grabs uh Chad, fucking uh, the fucking moon just stands up, cracks like just puts his gun through the window, just <laughs> shoots him in the arm. He's like, right. he's kind of just like hot, and then he just falls back down, like passed out. Which uh, I, I I didn't go, I didn't look and see who played the um. The, uh, the baby or like the infant versions of Chad and Alex but I think the infant for I think Chad was a girl okay sure uh, which kind of threw me off guard a bit like when I was just scrolling for the cast list and I was just picking out the main ones and then obviously we go to 25 years later where we see Chad and he is basically running this Along with Frank, they are running this, like, dancing slash karate, you know, thing, pretty much. Where I think, I think Frank, well, because I think they both take turns in both, but I think, well, because I, I think, I think Frank does mostly the karate stuff, and then Chad does mostly the ballet stuff. I, well, it's not really established, it, except for that one thing where it's like, oh, they, they have a, you know, a business, and then... They fucking fly off to Hong Kong to for for what Frank says is uh, more business opportunities. But it's like you know, you know, he because we see the because he hires a private investigator to see like where Alex could be, and he shows some photos, and he's like, "Well, that that, that has to be him." So that's just like a ruse to say, "Yeah, come on, Chad, you're going to Hong Kong with me so that we can stop, you know, you know, so we can get back what's rightfully yours." And then we, they eventually go to this like bar kind of area, and then there's this one girl who you know takes an interest to Chad, and takes him to the back the back room, and it starts like getting kind of you know frisky. And all of a sudden, you see this fucking arm just like grab him on the back, and he's like, "Hey!" And he's like, "What?" And Chad's like, "You can see it on his face." He's like, "What the?" And boom! This headbutt knocks Chad clean out, and then that's basically where. He wakes up, and then Frank basically explains where, like, um, yeah, like, you know, there was this guy named, you know, Nigel Griffith who worked on this bridge uh, with your father, and uh, basically when their expertise were not needed anymore, him and his wife were murdered, but uh, they screwed up because they forgot that they, but they didn't know that they had two children, Chad and Alex. And then, basically, over the course of the movie, they go through their mostly tough, you know, moments where, basically, it's just, um, it's just Alex talking shit to Chad and being like, yeah, you're, you're basically just saying you're a no good piece of shit. And then, by the end, they, you know, come around to, like, as being like, yeah, we're, we're brothers, we're both gonna take these some bitches down because, you know, they... They kidnap Frank and then Alex's girlfriend, who was the girl that was seducing Chad, thinking that it was Alex. And then, obviously, you know, they go to, the, like, the final set piece, and then, you know, they're, like, they they kill all the bad guys, and like, yay, we did it. And that's pretty much about it. But pretty simple. Now to go over the cast, we obviously have the main star, Jean-Claude Van Damme, as both uh, Chad, who is basically the, like, the, the more the martial arts and kind of, like, uh, the comic relief uh, of the movie. And then we have Alex, who basically is, like, the, the more, like, rugged, like, kind of guy who just goes in guns blazing where Chad's more like okay what's like when he gets into fights it's more martial arts where Alex is more gunfights so it's like okay I like that dynamic where it's like okay one's is stri like more strictly martial arts while the other one's more strictly um more, more gun oriented and it's like okay I kind of like that and by this point Jean-Claude Van Damme was really getting he, he was still figuring it out, but he had cemented himself as, like, I can be an actor as well as a martial artist. You know, especially with, like I said, you know, Lionheart really saying, like, yeah, 
I can be an actor while also being a you know a martial artist. And this film only just carries that he does great as both of these roles. And it's like if you really think about it, this role, this movie is more impressive for Jean Claude Van Damme than the previous one, where it's like yeah, the previous one he really got to first, he really got to like. Uh, display his acting chops for the first time but like this film he's like he, ha he has to play two separate roles and he did it really good so it's like I feel like this one's more more a, a triumphant um like a, a win for Van Damme but as a film I think I slightly prefer his acting in Lionheart because it's more heartfelt than in this film but this is still commendable that he did you know, like, like he still did all of his stuff, which is you know incredible to think about. Then we have uh, Jeffrey Lewis as, as the uh, as Frank Avery, who is basically uh, the uncle. Actually, no, not even the uncle. Basically, yeah, he's the bodyguard to Paul and and his wife. And when they get killed, he takes Chad and basically poses himself as his uncle. So that, you know, he can just, you know, just cement that fam family aspect in his mind. And he does great as this role. We have uh, Alona Shaw, I think, as Daniel Wilde. And I'll be honest, she's pretty wooden too. But unlike Paul, where he's only in like a few scenes and then gets killed off, Danielle's in like basically the entire movie and yet is pretty wooden throughout the, the entire movie there except for the like the few scenes where gets, she gets to show like genuine emotion she's really good at those moments but when she's just like trying to act it's it's just so wooden and bad that it's just like it kind of just makes me cringe watching her act where it just feels like that she's not really putting that much effort into it while van damme is like putting so much effort into it Efforts into it, sorry. We have uh, Philip Chen, or Philip Chen, fuck, Chain, as uh, Raymond Zhang. He's great as this, as this like you know, kind of over the top villain, along with Alan uh, Scarfy as Nigel Griffith. And they, they they are both great as these like over the top kind of villains, especially Nigel Griffith. He's like more of like the, the hammy one where. Uh, where Zhang is like, he's basically more like the serious villain, but he could still have like, especially by the end where he's like, uh, he is kind of being more of like a kooky kind of character, but Nigel Griffith is fucking, it's almost like, like in terms of this film, he is practically a Looney Tunes character, like not directly obviously, but the way that he acts compared to everyone else where it's so serious, the way that Alan, you know, performs Nigel is so comedic and so funny that it's just like he's a fucking Looney Tunes character and he's great like in that role uh we also have uh the fantastic Bolo Young as uh Moon who is the henchman that I mentioned earlier who basically becomes like the the, 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 the top henchman for Zhang if you guys are Jean-Claude Van Damme fans and just martial art fans in general you guys may remember that, you know, Bolo Young starred in Jean Claude's first really, really big starring role, and that is Bloodsport back in 1988. And before that, he starred in what is probably the most iconic martial arts movie ever, and that is Enter the Dragon, starring the fantastic late Bruce Lee, which I do plan on discussing along with the other four mainline Bruce Lee films. I just have to get Enter the Dragon first before I can actually start talking about all of them. Because I, I have all of them, except for Enter the Dragon, so I just need to get that one, and then that's probably going to be, like, something I'll probably most likely discuss next season, but yeah. But yeah, Bolo Young does great, like, because the thing is, he's good when he, like, especially in this film, he doesn't say really, like, I think he says, like, a few words, honestly, but that works with this character, whereas, in, like, okay, Bolo Young in Bloodsport is great, but the fact that they just kind of tried to replicate like other martial arts villains that say very few words, and it just seems like kind of weak in that aspect. As like a villain is like you're just trying to replicate other 
better ones. Whereas this film, it's like, yeah, okay, he's basically the henchman, like the top henchman. So him not saying really that much actually works in that benefit. We have uh, uh, Corinna Ezerson, I think that's how you say it, as Kara, who is like the basically the henchman to Nigel Griffith. Like basically each villain has their own hench like top henchman. So for Zang it's like it's it's Moon. And then for Griffith it's Kara. And Kara is just like so weird and yet like her acting is kind of like Nigel Griffith where it's like it's kind of over the top like where it's funny. And it's like not as over the top as Griffith, but it's like it's almost there and it's funny. And she does great with that role. And then finally, we have uh, Peter uh, Maloto or Malata as bodyguard with spears. I that's legit what it says on fucking Google and IMDb and Wikipedia. That's what that's what that character is, is just named. They they don't give him a name in the movie. It's just bodyguard with spurs. It's basically the one guy that has like a mullet and that has like the cowboy boots that fights Alex in that one scene where it's like all dark and it's like it has very few like. It's very darkly lit, and it's basically a very dark room. And then, they, it's, like I said, it's the guy with the mullet and then, like, the cowboy boots. That's who I'm talking about. He does fine. Kind of like, um, kind of like with Bolo Young, he barely says anything, but I think that's more down to the fact that he just has not that much screen time before he's, you know, beaten up and I'm presuming killed by, um... By Alex. So, yeah. Uh, I only have one fact on this because, uh, I honestly, the plot synopsis took up so much room that when I tried to, when I was doing all the main characters, when I got to uh, the last guy, I only had the one line left. And usually for my scripts, I leave a line between everything. So, like, rating and then space, budget, then space, and stuff like that. So, the whole summary then space and then all the main cast members and then space and there's only one like one like i can show you right here you can kind of see last cast member right here space and then the fun fact would have been right here and obviously there was nothing there so i only have one and it's actually kind of nice that you know i should like this actually, i'm presuming that this happened so basically due to the strong friendship on the set of blood sport back in 1988 Van Damme wanted no one else to play the role of a moon in this film than Bolo Young because he knew that he was such like a big like intimidating guy that he's like yeah get Bolo Young for this role and then like we're good and obviously they casted him and the rest is history pretty much so to talk about favorite scenes uh kind of like the like Dante speak this film is just so good that like i can't really pick out a favorite scene really but if i just if i had to pick one i i have to go with the the van damme bolo young fight from you know at the end of this one where it's it's chad versus uh moon it's it's so fucking good is it as good as the blood sport fight it's on par i would say but you know this, if, if i had to pick out any standout moment it's that one because it's like that's the one that, like, even on the back cover, that shot of Van Damme right there is from the Bolo Young fight from this film. So it's like, I, I just had to go with that one. So the music for this film was done by a guy named Arthur uh, Cam uh, Campbell. Or Cam Paul Bell. No. No, no, okay, okay so it's. K E M P L E. So like, because I keep on saying Campbell, which is obviously a B. So, but basically, the, this guy only worked on I think a few, like he worked as like a, like a, an assistant on many TV and film scores, and like Lionheart, which was done. I forgot who did the score. I think it was John Scott. Yeah, John Scott for the for Lionheart. Uh, both, the, well, basically, for both of these films, the composer and Sheldon Lettish agreed to have a full-out orchestra instead of, like, electronic music. And for both these films, it fucking works. Uh, 
And there's there's one track that I, I actually was looking up last night. Um, which, by the way, um, I think the, the the latest edition of the soundtrack is I think widely available. I think even the well, even I think even the original print, uh, even though it it's uh the original CD release, even though it's out of print, you can easily find it for fairly cheap on like eBay and stuff like that. But uh, you can stream the music through like iTunes and Spotify and stuff like that. That's why I heard the like the isolated score by itself and the one track that always stood out to me, which I think it's track three on the latest on the Spotify edition, is I think it's called the Brothers Revenge, and it's like this very intense music that basically makes me like okay yeah I basically it's like one of those things where it's like you hear a piece of music from a movie and it's like. That make that track makes you want to go and watch the movie like right then. That's why I want to do every single time I hear that piece of music, or it's like, oh my god, I I want to watch this, the movie so bad because of that track. Um, I could probably I'm gonna look at it real quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Brothers Revenge track three on the on the 2012 release of the soundtrack. So. You, I think the 2012 version is out of print and is very difficult to find, but I think the original uh, print, the original CD release from 91, you can easily find on like eBay and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you could you could listen to the 2012 version through like Spotify and I believe uh, iTunes as well. And yeah, I highly do recommend listening to it because it's great. So yeah, I got really nothing else to say. So. Final thoughts on Double Impact from 90, 1991. I think it's a really good martial arts movie. Is it as good as Lionheart? O almost. This one is almost as good as Lionheart. There are a few scenes, I, I can't lie, throughout this film that, you know, do kind of drag it down, especially in the middle, really. It's like the beginning's really good, the ending's really good, and then but like certain scenes in like the middle kind of drag a lot. Uh, so that's why it's missing out on A plus, even an A rank. So I'm gonna, but I can't, I can't give it a B because it, this film is so good in my opinion that I have to at least give this film an A minus. So that's what I'm doing. I'm gonna give this film an A minus because it's so good. I highly do recommend it. Uh, this MVD Blu-ray it should be relatively available. I think around thirty bucks. So yeah, it shouldn't be that bad. Uh, special features wise, it comes with um. You know the the movie and its original uh, one eighty five to one aspect ratio with a two point oh stereo sound and a um I think uh, a oh no, it's it's just stereo okay uh, with a a new two part documentary about it about making this film which is ironically named the making of Double Impact um uh, new uh, deleted and extended scenes. Uh, double Impact anonym, Anatomy of a Scene that's new for this Blu-ray and then you have the original 1991 behind the scenes featurette uh, B-roll selections uh, promotional film clips uh, uh, cast and crew interviews uh, Double Impact uh, MVD Rewind pro uh, collection promo with a original theatrical trailer and like um, like uh, Lionheart a cool little um I can get this unfolded and not rip the thing because that would be really sad. A little mini poster, which is basically just like a, the MVD cover art. So, yeah, and I, I think oh no, it's it's just the Blu-ray because I I know that um the Lionheart one was a, a DVD and Blu-ray thing. So, yeah, and also for some reason this Lionheart Blu-ray is region free. Actually, yeah, I'll show it off. Region free, right there. That's what the, if anyone does not know, that's what the ABCs on the back of your Blu-ray means. And yet, for some reason, the um, uh, the Double Impact Blu-ray is region locked to region A. I don't know why that's the case. Um, but if anyone does know, leave leave uh leave it down in the comments below because I'm genuinely confused by that. So yeah, guys, that was the end of my Double Impact review. 
Uh, if you like this sort of content, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon to get notified when future videos are coming out. Like I said at the beginning of this review, uh, I'm not going to try and hit, I want to try and get up to 150 subscribers by the end of the year. It honestly seems feasible, so let's try and get that done. Um, you can also check, uh, click on my profile picture right here or click down on my username down there to go to my channel to check out my other videos. Uh, also, check out the latest two videos over here. Also, check out my social media pages, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Those will be down in the description below. That's basically when, you know, you get notified when videos are going to be coming out on my channel. And also follow me on Twitch because I'm going to be doing, I'll be doing some Twitch live streams every once in a while. Uh, whenever I have time from school and, you know, YouTube stuff. So, next, or no, uh, next to Monday, yeah, we will be discussing the Jackie Chan classic. Rumble in the Bronx, released in 1995. So, hope you guys stay tuned for the Rumble in the Bronx, Rumble in the Bronx review, uh, released in 1995, uh, next Monday. Oh, also, I'll be having another video out tomorrow, but I'm not going to spoil it just yet. Maybe it has to do something with a certain TV show that the fifth season just came out today. But I won't spoil, you know, my videos. I don't want to, you know, throw too many videos out there, so... Expect a new video tomorrow, and then on Monday for the Rumble in the Bronx review. Live long and prosper. Out.